Hello everyone, it is seven o'clock. We are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Julie Watson and I am joined tonight by Caitlin Lynch. She is one of our Conservation Education AmeriCorps members and she will be helping out with the chat. Um, she'll be helping out with the Q&A and we're gonna spend the next 45 minutes to an hour introducing you to birding what it is, what skills you need to be good at it. Uh, birding is a super fun outdoor activity that anyone can participate in. And with some of these basic skills that we're gonna learn tonight, um, you can become a birder or a better birder. This is the first program of a whole birding series that will be happening on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. So if this is your jam and you are into birds and you wanna become a better birder, then keep Wednesdays at 7 p.m. on your calendar uh, because this will be where it's at. So before we begin, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. Everyone is muted. And so uh, we also can't see you, can't see you, can't hear you. Uh, you can be at your house as comfortable as you want. And um, as we go through this program, though, there will be opportunities to interact with uh, Caitlin through the chat box, which a lot of you have already used. That is down at the corner of your, uh, of your screen with that chat uh, icon and if you want to use that chat function, it's important that you change this part to say all panelists and attendees. So it defaults to all panelists, which means that only Caitlin and I can see what you're typing, but we want everyone to be able to see what you're typing so you guys can have conversations in that chat box. So make sure that you change your chat to say to all panelists and attendees. Now, as we go through this program, you can use that chat box um, to interact with other people. You can also use that Q&A box, which is also down at the bottom of your screen and it says Q&A. And that's where you can ask questions. That's where I would recommend you ask questions. Um, Caitlin can answer those a lot more easily than in the chat, but please feel free to use both to interact um, with any of us. Um, we do ask that you please keep any conversation within the Q&A and the chat to be on topic and to be PG. This is a family program. Um, you do not need to raise your hand either. Just that chat function in the Q&A will be just fine. Um, and if you have any technical problems, let Caitlin know you can message her, you can use the Q&A and she will help you out with anything like that too. In addition to the chat box in the Q&A, we are also gonna use polls and you'll see those pop up on the screen. They're pretty easy to use. And at the end of this program, there will be a survey. So please give us some feedback. We really, we listen to them and we do read them and we put them to use. There's also a comment section if there's a topic that you really wanna see us cover. Uh, put it in the comments and, and maybe we'll, we will uh, do, the, do the program that you recommend. So we're going to start with a poll. You, I'm going to put it up on your screen now. And it's just to figure out, do you know what birding is? Are you an expert birder? Never heard of it? Know what it is? Heard the word before, but that's about it. Awesome, awesome. So we have a couple people in here that have never heard of it. There's some that have heard the word before, but that's about it. And a lot of people that know what it is. We've got one expert birder in here so far, which that's a good thing. This is a beginner birding program. So expert birder can probably help us out in the chat with anyone <laughs> with sharing any resources going to give you two more seconds to answer in the chat or in the poll. All right, so a lot of you know what birding is and we've got uh, a couple experts in here and a couple people that have never heard about it, but I think we are in good company. So thank you for joining us tonight. I think you're in the right place. Um, 
with people that know what birding, know what it is, but want to learn more. So what is it? The Wikipedia definition is bird birding or bird watching. It's a form of wildlife observation in which the observation of birds is a recreational activity or a citizen science, um, which means that people are going out and looking at birds and then they're submitting to um, crowdsourcing databases their observations, which is a really cool way to use birding. It can be done with the naked eye through visual optics like binoculars and telescopes by listening for bird sounds or with the technology that we have today, a lot of people can bird and watch birds through webcams. Um, I know a big one that people really, really like are those eagle nest cams. People get obsessed about those, but there are a lot of different ways to bird. So who and where? The cool thing about birding is that it is a such, it's such a great activity because anyone can do it from anywhere. Um, you can even bird online, like I said, with those online cameras, you can do it through your windows. Um, you can also go out on a hike and look for birds. So it is a very equal opportunity activity. Anyone can do it. It is also a great activity because it doesn't require very many things. So things, I have a list here of things that you need, but the reality is that you don't actually need anything. So these suggestions here, like the binoculars and other things that I'm going to talk about, they're not really necessary. You can go out and bird with just your eyeballs and just looking. As long as you are in a spot where we, you can see birds, you are birding. Um, but some of these tools are really helpful to see birds better, to help you ID them, to be able to submit your observations to some of those citizen science databases. Um, but binoculars are great to have. They're also something that you can get fairly cheap, cheaply. There's a big, um, a big difference in price there. You can get a pretty cheap, cheap pair. You can also spend several grand on a pair of binoculars too. So there's a lot of uh, range in prices on those tools. Uh, field guides are a really nice thing to have, not completely necessary, but if you want to get into birding, I would say it's, it's pretty necessary to get better at birding, at identifying birds. And then there's also a lot of apps out there. There's a lot of apps, there's a lot of websites that you can use to help identify birds. One of my favorite apps to ID birds is the Merlin Bird ID app, which is done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And the Cornell Lab of Ornithology also has a great website called All About Birds that I highly recommend if you are into birds at all that you go to that site, check it out. Um, notebooks are also a good thing to have when you are birding so that you can write down your observations if you want to. But again, none of these things are, are necessary. Um, but binoculars, spotting scopes, optics, field guides, apps, all of those things make them make birding a lot easier and make you make it more accessible. Um, but one of the best birders that I ever met was actually blind. It was one of my old bosses and he was blind and he uh, was a wonderful birder. He taught me so many bird sounds because he birded by ear. And it just goes to show that birding really is an activity for everyone. Anyone can do it. So before we get into the uh, big four that we're gonna be talking about tonight, I have to do a little bit about birding ethics. So birding is a wildlife observation activity. And so it does involve potential interaction with wild animals. And when we are in an area where we have a potential for that, there are certain ethical behaviors that I am going to just briefly mention just because I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. So keeping your distance is really important. The basis being that while you are birding, you make your best effort not to disturb the, the birds or their habitat. So keep your distance from the birds, travel lightly on the habitat. Um, having binoculars and scopes really helps you keep your distance from birds and come in handy to make sure that you are able to observe birds from a safe distance. Um, being particularly respectful of nesting birds 
is also really important. And in some cases, you could be breaking the law because it is illegal to disturb the nests of eagles or endangered species or other protected species. So good to be very careful about that. Respecting private property is really important too. Um, I don't think you want people wandering into your personal yards because of a bird. So making sure that you know where public land and private land start or end is a good idea. And um, uh, a good thing too that I really like is the American Birding Association says birders should always give back more than they take. And so when we are going out and we're birding, it is always a good idea to make sure that um, we are just leaving the area better the way that we're leaving it better than how we found it. So just being ethical in that regard. So um, we see birds all the time. We're really lucky. That's what I think one of the reasons that makes birds so interesting to us is that birds are everywhere. They're, we probably see birds almost every single day, see or hear without us even, even knowing it. But how do we know, how do we figure out which birds are which? Well, it does take a lot of practice, but we are going to spend the rest of this webinar going over four basic skills that you can use to build your birding skills. So these are basically four focus areas that can make you better at identifying birds and make you a better birder. So these are called the big four and they are size and shape, color pattern, behavior, habitat, and range. So that's what we're gonna spend the rest of this time talking about. These are not the only skills to learn. There are other things to make note of when you're observing, but these are things that you can, when you are observing birds, you wanna make note of these specific things. So if it is a bird that you don't know, you've made note of all these things and you can take it to your resource such as a field guide or an app or a website and you can whittle down to the species that you saw. We are gonna get started with size and shape. And to start, I have a silhouette here and I'm going to put a pole out and I want to see if you can tell me by just the silhouette what, what kind of bird this is. So I've got the pole up. So the options are hawk, owl, great horned owl, or eagle. So far, I can tell we've already got, you guys are already on your way to becoming birders. I can already tell. So here's those results. Almost everyone picked either owl or great, horn, great horned owl, which is awesome. That means that you, a lot of you already have a basis on using shape to determine what a bird is. And you notice all, everyone knew it was an owl and you even got it to species. And it is a great horned owl, you're right. That is the silhouette of a great horned owl. And uh, you're all on the road to becoming great birders, which is awesome. But from just that silhouette, I'm very impressed. You could tell that it was not only just an owl, but what type of owl. And that just goes to show how important size and shape really is to identifying birds. And while you guys were looking, you probably noticed that owls have kind of wide bodies and great horned owls specifically have those ear tufts, which are just feathers. Their ears are actually on the side of their heads, just like us. These are not their ears. Um, it has these distinctive ear tufts. So the wide body lets us know that it's probably an owl or some type of other raptor. And then those ear tufts really gave it away in the silhouette. So that's a really good skill to have is learning these, these sizes and these shapes. So bird shapes are helpful in knowing what you might be looking at at a higher level. So we were able to get two species that the great horned owl but some of you knew you were like, I know this is just an owl. So those shapes can help us 
get to that higher level. And if you know what that higher level of bird is, what type of bird it is, you can go into your field guide or your apps or go online and you can whittle it down to species. So um, when we go into our resources such as field guides and apps like Merlin Bird ID, not all field guides are organized exactly the same way. Some are by color, some are by geographic area, but most are actually by species and it's pretty standardized. So one of my favorite field guides, I really like the National Geographic ones because they have little tabs on the side and each of these tabs are groups of birds. So this one starts with hawks, sandpipers, gulls, flycatchers, warblers, sparrows, and the very beginning are waterfowl. Now most field guides and the Merlin Bird ID app, if you're, if you're just browsing the species, they go in a very specific order. So for example, in this, um, this graphic right here is showing different silhouettes of different birds and you can see it it's labeling them. And so ducks, geese, hawks, and shorebirds, those are gonna be found at the beginning of your field guides. So for example, in my field guide, this is all of those are gonna be in this like first third of my book. Then owls and hummingbirds and woodpeckers are in this part of my book. And then almost the last half are gonna be our perching birds and the passerines right here. So most of our birds and our guides are gonna be these little perching birds um, because they have the most species and they're also the littlest ones and they're the hardest to ID. So they take up most of your field guides. But that is just a good thing to remember that different birds have different shapes and sizes. And these are some of those distinctive ones. So for example, if we're looking at a, wood, at a woodpecker, they have these distinctive shapes to them, like the big long beak, or maybe we're looking at a hawk or an eagle or another type of raptor. They're gonna have a hooked beak. And these are pretty common things that most of you who have even just a little bit of interest in birds probably are already starting to notice. Like goose, we know that they have big large bodies, they have webbed toes, they have flat bills, and we're probably going to find them around water. Um, our shorebirds, our gulls, like this killdeer is going to have longer legs because they're used to being near water or in grasslands. And then of course our perching birds are going to be perching. So, so that, those are some of our, um, some of our shapes and it really helps to get to know these um, on a basic level just to get started so that you can start whittling your way down and working your way through the resources that you have. Now size. Size is easiest to determine by comparing it to birds that you, you're already familiar with. Now this right here, this is a screenshot taken directly from the Merlin Bird ID app. I really, really like the way that they um, display or ask you what size the bird was. And um, I don't want to go too much into this app because I believe uh, someone's going to cover it next week in the tools because it is such a great tool. But the Merlin Bird ID basically asks you four questions and you can probably guess what those four questions are. It's size and shape, color, pattern, behavior, and habitat, which are the four things that we're covering today. Uh, but this is how they ask you what the size is. And so we know how big a goose is more or less. We know how big a crow is. We know about how big a robin is and sparrow or smaller, et cetera. So seeing whatever bird you saw and thinking about these other birds that you're, you're familiar with, you can kind of get a range of a size in there. Or um, if you have a field guide, you can use that too. So say you saw this bird here, which is a, these are wrens. Oh, it's a Buick's wren, excuse me, a Buick's wren and the size, which I apologize about the resolution on this, but the size is usually listed right under the name of the bird. And say you saw that bird, you could look at the size in your field guide. And if you're familiar with another size bird, maybe it's a red-tailed hawk, 
maybe it's a hummingbird, maybe it's a robin, you can go to those in your field guide and compare those sizes and see like, oh, you know, this was actually bigger, bigger than a robin or smaller than a robin or what have you. And you can compare it that way as well. So that is size and shape. Uh, Caitlin, any questions on size and shape before we move on to color pattern? Um, no, doesn't look like we have any specific questions on that. The only thing is that someone asked if we'll be addressing salmonella and I understand what they mean by that. I don't know if you do, but um, we can't address it. We, I don't know. we will not be talking about salmonella, but um, uh, I don't know if we have, if that's something uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a problem yeah. here, you know. Yeah, not not right now at least, but um, we will not be addressing that, so sorry. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, we are going to move on to color pattern. So color in birds is probably one of the first things we notice about birds, but it varies a lot by species, by sex, by season, and by individual. So picking up on color patterns is more important than just straight up color. Color is very relative per person and very dependent on whether you saw the bird in full sun on a cloudy day, near dusk, or the time of year. Feathers can also fade over time. A newly molted bird is going to have nice, fresh, crisply, crispy, crisply colored feathers Whereas a bird that is about to molt is gonna have very dull colored feathers. So the example that I'm using here is a beautiful bird. Uh, this is the evening grosbeak. These are both males. So these are both the exact same bird. And I wanted to show some of these color differences, but you can also still see the pattern. So that is why it's not just straight up color, it's color pattern. So taking note of light versus dark rather than shade. And I will tell you, that's why a lot of field guides use um, illustrations rather than photographs because feathers can be so many different ranges um, just depending on all of those things that I just talked about. And I can tell you that uh, I used to work for the National Audubon Society and would identify birds for people all the time. And I would help them with a field guide so that we were doing it together and they were learning how to use a field guide. And um, I can't tell you how many times I was pretty sure I found the bird that they were talking about and they were so hung up on the color that it was like, oh no, my, my bird was much brighter than that. It looked just like that, but it was much brighter. Well, that's because this is a drawing and the drawing is probably intentionally muted because there is a wide range of colors. So focusing on color pattern rather than shade is really, really important. Um, but these are two of the same bird. They are both males. They are a beautiful, beautiful bird. Um, but you can see that the bottom here, this is a male in breeding plumage. You can see he's much brighter, much more distinctive. He is trying to attract the ladies. So he needs his feathers to be nice and bright and, um, and, and very attractive to the ladies. The bird on the top here, also a male, but this is in winter. You can see it's winter and he has no need. He's not trying to attract the males. So you can see there is a little bit less of a contrast. Everything is a little bit muted, but we can still see these patterns. There, this bird has dark wing tips with a white patch. You can see that on both of these. They have a lighter colored belly that is olive to yellow a darker colored head with that V on the face. So um, you can still use these patterns to ID this bird, even though there are different plumages. And just to reiterate that, I've got another one of my favorite birds. This is a Western tanager. And again, these are all males. And you can see how different their feathers can look. So that firework on their face can be different shades. And that depends also on breeding season. Um, like these guys on the bottom are probably smacked up in the middle of breeding season trying to, trying to match up with a lady. 
but the patterns are still the same. They have these dark wings with a double wing bar on there. And, um, and they do have a little bit of red on, on the face. I have seen males of these that have almost no red though. Um, so it's important to note that, and this one is a really good example on the back that you can see, you can see that yellow spot on the rump there too. So these are all patterns that we wanna be picking up. Now, obviously I would love to sit here and go through patterns of all sorts of different birds, um, but this is something that you need to study yourself to get better at birding. So the next one that we are going to move on to is behavior. And Caitlin, any questions, any pressing questions, or are we good to move on? No, we're good to move on. I'm pretty much got them covered. Awesome. 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 So we are going to move on to behavior. And again, just like with color, behavior runs a very, very wide range of things. And behavior is one of my favorite things to observe in birds and to learn about. And it also really, really helps with identification. Coloration can sometimes be very difficult, the color patterns, um, but behavior can really make a bird stick out to you. So it, it runs a very, very wide range, but there are some small things that we can learn about by watching birds. They can help us tell the difference between birds that look similar or are similarly sized. And so the first one we're gonna talk about is posture. Different birds just hold themselves differently when they're at rest or when they're just doing other things. So this example here is a marsh wren. And you can see it has its tail sticking straight up and it's calling. And marsh wren posture is very distinctive in that they often prop their tails up. And I compared that with another small brown bird, a chipping sparrow. You might think at first glance, they look a little bit alike. If you're an expert birder, they don't look anything alike to you. Um, but if you're just getting into birding, you might be seeing some similarities. Like for example, there is this white bar across the face on both of them, um, that eye streak. And they have similar coloration. They're also a fairly similar size. They're both pretty small birds. Um, but the chipping sparrow does not sit or ever really prop its tail up. It's going to have its tail sitting straight out like this. So it has a very different posture. And this is something that just takes time to uh, to observe birds. Um, and this is where the internet is nice. You can go on YouTube, watch lots of videos of birds, um, but also getting outside and just observing birds helps with this too. So the next one is movement. And movement is also a huge wide, wide range, very related to posture, um, but not all birds move in exactly the same way. And a good example of movement behavior that can be used to ID a bird is in the American Kestrel. And I'm gonna show you a video of a behavior that they do. And the reason I'm gonna show you this is because the American Kestrel is very similar in size and kind of in shape to a morning dove. And they also hang out in very similar places. So if you can't see the, the um, markings on these birds, which often happens if um, you're in low light or if the sun is behind these birds, they're just gonna look dark. Um, but morning doves also have like a long pointy tail similar to the kestrel, but a morning dove does not do this um, behavior that the kestrel does, which I'm gonna show you in this video, which is a little tail flick and there's no sound to this video. So um, if you can't hear anything, it's okay. But you can see that that kestrel is sitting there and it's balancing and it's just flicking its tail. Um, in this video, you can also see it bobbing its head, which is a really cool behavior. Um, but that tail flick is a very distinctive behavior that what you're seeing is a kestrel and not a morning dove. And uh, they bob their head like that, they think when they're looking for prey. So this kestrel is probably on the lookout for some small mammal. Oops, skipped one. 
So the last behavior that we're going to go over is flight pattern. Birds fly with different patterns and wing beats. Uh, these are really good details to take note of. Uh, one very easy to identify flight pattern is soaring. And there's a lot of birds that we can easily, we can easily identify as soaring birds like eagles, hawks, or um, uh, vol turkey vultures. And that's what's in this top photo. These are two golden eagles. And so these golden eagles here, they can soar like that for a long time. So that's a really distinctive way that they fly. On the other hand, I've got two ducks down here. These are wood ducks. And ducks are also really easy to identify when they're flying because they flap their wings super fast and it looks like they're about to fall out of the sky. So it's, those are some really easy ways to tell like, okay, I'm looking at a raptor or a hawk or an eagle, or I'm looking at a waterfowl or a duck that is, looks like it's barely keeping itself in flight. And uh, there's some other distinctive flight in there too. Like there's a, one of my favorites are the woodpeckers. They look, they're kind of in between soaring and looking like they're about to fall out of the sky, but they will beat their wings a couple times and then they'll stop and they actually pull their wings to their body. So when they fly, it actually looks like this. So they're like flap, 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 flap. And uh, that's very distinctive for a woodpecker. And these are just things that you learn over time when you are watching birds. And I will tell you, maybe not the safest place to observe birds, but birds in flight, very easy to see when you're driving. I can tell when I'm seeing a woodpecker when I'm driving, that's a very easy one to see, different soaring birds, um, different ducks that are flying over, um, but always keeping an eye out for these different types of behaviors. Because like I said, birds are truly everywhere. And if you keep your eyes open, you'll be able to catch some of these fun little details. And these are some of the things that I think makes birding really, really fun. So before we move on to our last number four topic of the big four, any questions, Caitlin, or are we good to proceed? I just have one question. Um, so this one is saying that they saw two owls flying in a circle. What does that mean? Um, so this could be behavior related. Owls flying in a circle. Um, Definitely an interesting. That is very interesting. Uh, I don't know what that means. It means, I mean, I'm. that would be very difficult to see just because owls are typically nocturnal. Um, but maybe it's some interesting uh, mating behavior. Yeah, I think it might be a mating behavior with great horned owls. I don't know. That's the only thing I could think of. Okay, I, I like this though. We've got a good question to Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if um, if someone's really like hard pressed to get the answer to this, they can um, email me and I can see. Yes, actually we love questions like this. I love having stuff to go look up afterwards. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the fourth, the fourth topic of our big four, which is habitat and range. So not all birds can live in every habitat. So knowing what birds can be found where can be very helpful with your bird ID. Um, and I know this has absolutely happened to me. I thought I saw a bird and then I looked it up and it didn't even live in the area that I was in. And the chances of me being, you know, seeing a rare bird way out of its range is very low. Uh, so I always assume that I did not see what I saw if it, if it is out of range. Um, but for example, I have a couple of habitats here that are pretty common here in Nevada, but you're probably not going to find a duck in the coniferous forest here. So that helps kind of whittle down what it is that you can potentially see. Whereas you're probably not going to find a woodpecker in this area where there's not a lot of trees and there is a lot of water. Um, <clears throat> so knowing what habitat you're in can also help you know what to look for and look out for as you learn what birds live where. Your field guides and your apps online will help give you information on this. And I've got some examples of a map. So 
in addition to habitat range and time of year is really important. So I picked a map that kind of covered everything. So as we know, birds are mi sometimes migratory. So maybe they only spend the winter here in North America. Maybe they only spend the summer here in North America. Um, but I picked the Golden Eagle range map here because it spends everything in North America so that you can see what these different colors are. And this map is straight from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website. And if you use Merlin Bird ID app, the maps look identical to this. They're just a little bit smaller because they're on your phone. Uh, but they are color coded exactly the same. We have um, the the summer summer range is going to be these orangey colors, and then their winter range is going to be these blues, these blues, and then the purple and the yellow. The purple is year round, and then the yellow is migration. So summertime is breeding and wintertime is non-breeding. And so you can kind of remember it with those cool and warm colors. And looking at this map, you can see that the golden eagle lives here in Nevada all year long. You could see it anytime. And it likes to also spend its summers up in Alaska and these upper areas in Canada, the British Columbia, Yukon Territory, et cetera. And it will spend its winter in some of the eastern United States, but they are scarce. So that's how you can use some of these maps. And this can help you with your birding in knowing what you're seeing, what's available during certain times of year, um, <clears throat> and knowing when certain things are breeding is really, really helpful. On the other side here is a really, really useful tool that I like to use. And this is on a resource called eBird. And um, we'll be covering this eBird more in our other, uh, other programs in this series. But uh, if you are interested in this resource, I can send you links to it as well. Um, but you can look in a specific area. So eBird has something called hotspots. And you can pull up all sorts of data. And this is where the citizen science part of birding is. So you can log all of your observations into eBird and it keeps and quantifies all this data so that people can use it. And one, of, this is one of those uses. So this is a specific area and I do apologize. I don't know where it's from. This is just from an, I didn't take it directly off of eBird. This is just a screenshot from eBird, um, but it looks like a wet area because these are, these are water birds, uh, but it's really, really cool to use because you can see it's got months here and it even breaks it down in weeks. So there's four columns per month because that's week, that's each week in a month. And you can see how prevalent birds are in that area during certain times of the year. And you can see how um, those bars go up and down. So for example, you could see a killdeer in this area any time of year, but especially in this summertime, that's when those bars are the widest, whereas black neck stilts are pretty rare all the time in this area. Um, <clears throat> but these are just more tools to have in your toolbox to use. I know um, when I go on vacations, I will go on to eBird and I'll find the nearest hotspot to where I'm going and I will look at these and then I will make a list of all the birds that I don't know. And then I will go into Merlin Bird ID and I will look up all of those birds profiles, look at what they look like, what their habitats are. And then there's also sounds. I'll look at what their sounds are, which we did not talk about on here because the big four is very basics. Um, when you get more advanced, that's where bird calls are gonna come into handy, but um, I will prepare for vacations using those tools so that I know what birds I could potentially see in these areas and I'm ready to ID them or at least I kind of know what they might look like or sound like and be prepared in that way. Um, but these are all tools in your toolbox to help you identify what birds you're seeing and continue you on your birding journey. And so those are those are the basics. To recap, these are the four 
basic things to focus on when birding. So learning more about size and shape, learning more about color patterns, behavior, habitat and range of the birds in your area, these will all help make you a better birder. So I basically just gave you a bunch of homework to do. Uh, focusing on these four things when you are out observing birds. So if you go outside and you're looking at birds in your notebook, these are the four things you're really gonna wanna use. And then if you have your app with you or if you can get a picture of that bird, you can use your field guide or use your app or use your website to help you figure out what those birds are. And to round this off, I've got some resources here. And I do want to let you know that next Wednesday, the program is going to be on birding tools. So a lot of the things that I just brushed the surface on are going to be covered next week, like eBird, like the Merlin Bird ID app, those different websites, binoculars, specs, those types of things are all going to be covered next week. Um, but these are some helpful resources that you can use in the meantime. Investing in a field guide is a really good thing to do. I know they are kind of old fashioned to have a physical book, but I use apps, I use websites as well, and I still like having a physical book to flip through if I need to. Um, using the Merlin Bird ID app, that's my favorite. I think that's probably the highest recommended one. Um, Audubon also has a good one. You can also use, um, there's a couple other ones, but I really do like the Merlin Bird ID app. You can take a picture of a bird and if you get a good enough picture, it can ID it from your picture. Or you can go through those four questions based off of the big four that we covered today. Uh, you can also go to All About Birds, which is the website done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And there are bird, um, bird species accounts for every species. And it'll tell you all sorts of fun information, um, where they lay their eggs, how many eggs they lay, what they eat, fun facts, how fast they can fly, things like that, and pictures and videos comparing males to females, what other birds look like them. There is just a ton of information on there. Um, you can also learn about getting better at birding. They actually have a whole page set up about the big four. So if you want to learn more about the four things that we talked about today, that's a good place to go. And then the last one I'm going to recommend is eBird. And eBird, if you are at all interested in birding, you should make yourself an account um, and you can start logging your bird observations. You can also go in and explore all of their data. They have a bunch of really cool maps. You can look up species accounts for birds and where they're being found. A really cool thing to go in and explore too. Um, and before we go to questions at the very end here, there will be a survey that pops up when you exit this webinar. So please take the survey, let us know how we're doing, give us um, any sort of, uh, uh, if there are topics that you want to see us cover in these webinars, throw it in there. We may um, we're always looking for suggestions, and if you have any questions or you need any of these resources sent to you, you can email me. That's my email right there. Um, and Caitlin, if you want to take yourself off mute, if there's any other questions coming through. Yeah, let's see. There's just one that's two questions in one. So the question is, I live in Washington, but frequent Las Vegas regularly to visit family. Where is the must go next time I'm there for birding? So for birds, I suggest the Clark County Wetlands Park. Um, it's beautiful. I think it's a great place to see birds because there's water. Um, it's also a very large. If you haven't been there, that is what I recommend. They also have um, a building there that has lots of educational things. And I think, I know, well, before COVID, we did birding walks there. So got to throw that out there. And I think the Wetlands County Park might, their staff might be doing bird walks there too now, but that's my number one recommendation in Las Vegas. 
Awesome. Yeah. I've never really gone birding necessarily in Las Vegas. So I was like, I don't know. Um, okay. And then the second question is uh, with plants, I always recommend learning families first if people want to learn the plants around them and then they have a jumping off point anywhere they go. Mm -hmm. Is the systematics approach useful for birds as well? Or would you recommend a different approach? No, exactly the same thing that makes so much sense. And that is what I was trying to get at when we were talking about size and shape. So your field guides are actually organized more or less by families of birds. And so if you know what some of those shapes are, those silhouettes, you can get to that family and then whittle down to species. So yes, absolutely. Same, same concept. And then the other one is, what is the difference between warblers and sparrows? Uh, warblers are different. They're different birds. I don't know exactly what the difference are. Um, warbler, this is, this is purely my opinion. Warblers migrate more. They sing more. They're more um, arboreal. They're more in uh, heavily treed forests. And there, there are a lot more yellow warblers a lot of warblers are just yellow. They're very difficult to identify by sight, but they're a lot more easily identified by sound. Whereas sparrows, I associate sparrows more with grasslands and forests, and they kind of span a lot of those different areas, and a lot of sparrows are brown. They actually get a nickname called LBJs, called little brown jobs. Uh, because they're all just brown and that is my that is not scientific those are just my that is my opinion on the difference between sparrows and warblers yeah I would say that warblers are going to be more of like a yellow like fun colors and then mm -hmm. sparrows are like kind of more drab like browns yes black, whites not that one is better than the other <laughs> no no they're, they're all great but you know <laughs> easy way to tell the difference and i think that's it. oh wait no i got a bunch of other questions coming <laughs> um whoops um so what is the best time to spot eagles and owls so it depends on where you are and i will apologize I am from the Midwest and the winter time was the best time to see eagles in our area. Here, I know in the Reno Carson City area, a really good time to see eagles is when in Carson City is when uh, the cows drop their calves because the eagles will go out and eat the placental leftovers, sometimes even calf stuff. Um, in that area, that's a really good place to go see eagles. Um, owls are a pretty year-long thing here. I know I have a um, great horned owl that is around my neighborhood and I see it and he, we can hear it in, inside our apartment too all the time. Awesome. So um, next question is, what do you think about bird feeders? So bird feeders can be done in a good way and they can be done in a bad way. I'm pro bird feeder. I think it's a great way to observe what you're seeing, but you are taking a responsibility. You are attracting wildlife to your yard. And um, we get a lot of calls about this. Sometimes people attract wildlife that they don't want and that's not how bird feeders work. So just because you are putting out bird feed, it doesn't mean you're just going to get birds. Um, oftentimes people end up with squirrels that are unwanted and those more birds in your yard can also mean other types of predators, um, like other bird predators. And um, some people have different feelings about that uh, on whether you want like a Cooper's hawk or a sharp shin hawk in your backyard preying on the little birds in your bird feeders. The other thing about bird feeders to remember too is you are attracting large groups of birds together. And as we have learned with a year of a pandemic is when you have large groups of living things in one area, diseases can spread really easily. So um, it's a good idea to keep an eye out on your bird feeder for how healthy the birds are 
And if you are having some sort of outbreak, like conjunctivitis is a really common one. Yes, it's it's pink eye in birds. Um, that's a really common one, but it's it's deadly to birds. Um, so really keeping an eye out and taking responsibility for your bird feeders, keeping them clean. If you do spot an outbreak, taking your feeders down and letting it work itself out of the system and then putting it back up on um, mold can be in your feeders. Hummingbird feeders is a whole other story. Um, they have to be very, very clean. Also get rid of the red dye. You don't need it. <laughs> um, but that's my quick and dirty on bird feeders. I'm pro bird feeder, but it is a responsibility that you are taking and you can't control what you are um, attracting to your yard. Yeah, I believe that bird feeders are complicated, but awesome. Um, and then the next one's where would you bird in the Reno area? Oh, there's so many places. Um, yeah. I live in Northwest Reno, so I'm really lucky because I'm uh, a little out of town. So like I see a lot of birds all the time just outside. Um, but I really like Rancho San Rafael. Um, obviously going to Chickadee Ridge in uh, the winter is a fun experience um, and just FYI you do not have to have food they will still fly to you so you don't have to be feeding them uh, to have the your own uh, your own experience at Chickadee Ridge um, oh actually one of my favorite places to see birds is uh Oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking what it is, but it is a wetland park, it has a three mile loop that goes around a water feature in South Reno. And I have seen amazing birds there. There are black neck stilts, avocets, um, all sorts of waterfowl, harriers, just all sorts of birds. Caitlin, do you know what I'm talking um, about? I live down here, I'm trying to think. Um, are you thinking of Hidden Valley? No, it's, um, is it by Damani Ranch? Yes, it's Damani Ranch Wetland Park. Oh, I yeah, that. I live right by there. There's definitely lots of avocets. Um, yes. you know, it's a good area. So, yes, it's an awesome area. The trail around it is really nice and paved. Um, I like to run it, I'll run around it and see people doing all sorts of activities. That's a great place to go look for birds, especially water birds. Cool. Um, let's see, what are the pros and cons in using a playback bird call? Ooh, so I, I've looked this up. There isn't a ton of data on it. So I can't really give you any data on whether it is dangerous or not. I personally don't do that when I'm outside. I don't really want to do anything that isn't, that's a, a big part of ethics is I don't want to do anything that's disrupting the birds and calls are doing that. Um, I know pishing used to be a big thing in the birding community and it's not really anymore, um, which pish, pishing is going psh, 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 when you are out birding and it sounds like an alarm call. And so it calls a bunch of birds to you. And there was a lot of uh there there was dispute about it because you were you were changing birds behavior so if say there was a predator bird near where you are and then you were attracting birds to your area because you did this alarm call things like that i don't do any of those things i will listen to bird calls prior to going out um, but if i'm listening to a bird call and i'm outside i usually try and keep it down so that i am not disrupting any of the birds that I'm seeing. Okay. Um, someone asked, what is the most common bird in Nevada and the least common? I mean, there's lots of least common birds, but. That's a really good question. I don't know what the most common bird is. My guess would be a starling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or like a crow or something. Yes, you know, yeah, that, would be, that would be my guess is some like very, a bird that flocks in very large numbers. And I have no idea what the least common would be. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess, okay, so someone's asking, um, I would like to have a class on just Sparrow ID. So do we know if in the birding series we have just, you know, bird, like Sparrow ID or? 
No, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, the local Audubon chapters might have something like that. I know I have a book that is just on sparrows uh, in North America. If you email me, I can give you the name of the book. Okay. Yeah, it's, I don't think anyone picked that one up, but. That's very specific. Um, and then how do you tell the difference between a first year red tail and a Swainson hawk? So, okay, this, I almost used the red tail as an example for color pattern. So red tail hawks, no matter what age they are, they have a dark belly band. And that is something to remember is that even if they are, red tail hawks come in all sorts of different colors, which is really, really cool, but can be frustrating for IDing, but they have that dark, they have a dark band on their breasts, even if they have darker feathers, there's always a dark band across their chest. And sometimes it's a little lower, sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's difficult to see, but that is a good thing to look at. Um, I was taught it that it's light, dark, light. Now, not all red tail hawks have super light breasts. Most of them do, but that light, dark, light, light is going to be that color pattern that you're looking at um, to help discern from other hawks. Um, someone said, where would you bird in Carson City? Um, I like Washoe Lake. I saw a bald eagle there the last time I was there, which was really cool. So I really like Washoe Lake, but I have to be honest, I'm not super familiar with the Carson City area. Um, but I do like Washoe Lake, which I know is kind of in between here and Carson City, but... Sorry, my dog's going a little crazy, but um, someone said, <laughs> uh, what, are there a million flycatchers in Nevada? You know, I don't know. I don't think so. I think those are an Eastern bird, but I could try and look it up real quick. Let's do one more question, Caitlin, and then um, if you have other questions or if your question didn't get answered, feel free to email me or Caitlin. And we would be happy to share any resources, um, any answer, any of your questions, so. Let's see, I'll take the last one as where do you see migratory birds in the Reno area? Everywhere, uh, most of our birds migrate. So um, if you're talking about like waterfowl, cause waterfowl tend to be migratory, but um, most of our birds do, do migrate, um, especially our summer birds. So like neotropical migrants, which those are birds that are coming from um, the Southern hemisphere and coming up here to spend their summers and breed. Those are typically more forested birds and more of the perching birds. So in any of our forested areas, that's where the warblers and the different flycatchers and vireos, that's where we're gonna see those types of birds. Um, but yeah, we have lots and lots of migratory birds. And I found the vermilion flycatcher. It is a beautiful bird. If you can see that, it's this one right here. And it, if it is seen, it would be seen in very, very Southern Nevada. So that's cool. All right, well, if you have other questions, send them to me, send them to Caitlin. Thank you so much for everyone that stuck around to ask questions. Um, you can also save your questions for next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for the next birding series. But thank you so much for joining us and um, hope to see you on some of our other birding, uh, birding webinars. Thanks. <laughs>